you get paid this flat rate every time you see a patient. If the patient shows up, you get paid. If they don't show up, that's not my problem. So if they cancel, they don't show up, if you don't get them scheduled, if you don't provide quality care and so they don't come back, if they don't want to see you, they want to see somebody else, then that's not going to come out of my end, right? So the idea was to just shift some of the risk from me to the provider. But in that same vein, some of the reward. Kick it. Welcome to Strata Stories. My name is Thomas Schreiber. I'm the director of marketing here at Strata PT. Strata PT is a single EMR platform and revenue cycle management service for physical, occupational, and speech therapy practices that helps you achieve a 99.99% reimbursement rate. On today's episode, Paul Singh, the CEO of Strata PT, talks with Jake Irwin, who is a PT and the owner of Pro Performance Therapy. Pro Performance has been around for 17 years, and Jake is also a PT and professor at Georgia State University. Paul and Jake talk through the advantages of paying clinicians on a per visit basis, shifting the risk and reward from owners to therapists, why every therapist is a salesperson, tactical advice on how therapists can generate clients for themselves, and lastly, the importance of being part of the community in order to generate referrals. If you'd like to learn more about Strata PT and see how our EMR and RCM works, head over to stratapt.com to book a demo. Now, without further delay, here's today's episode. So it started out 17 years ago in April of uh, 07. Um, I had been working for a corporate practice. I didn't, I just didn't like the constant metrics, the focus on productivity, um, the focus on the dollar um, and not the focus on the patients. And I felt like there was a better way and which that could still be effective and still could still be a marketable, successful practice. So started out then and uh, with one office and over the course of the years, we always started off, we started off with our first office, we sublet from a baseball training facility. And we kind of used that model throughout for, for a really long time, just kept subletting from sports training facilities, baseball, uh, other sports, whatever we could, so that we could kind of have a lot of our expenses covered and have sort of a built-in patient base. The problem with that was that um, those places go out of business a lot. So we kept having to find a new location and remarket and start over, over and over again. Um, so finally in like summer of 2018, we were renting from one of those places that were going out of business. I found a personal training studio that was right outside the neighborhood where I live, um, that would sublet to me and they were planning on leaving in a year and a half. And so they wanted us to take over the space when they left. And I had never, I had only one time done standalone retail space and it cost us a ton of money and it just was never successful. And I didn't like the idea, but it was clear we couldn't keep doing what we were doing. Um, and just moving from place to place over and over again. So we started there. We signed the lease agreement to take over the space in March of 2020, right before everything stopped. Yeah, uh, good timing. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, it was, it, there was no way we could have known that was going to happen. Right. So, yeah. uh, so we took on this three-year lease right when just the whole world shut down. And because of that, the other leases we had, and I know this isn't exactly where we were talking about going, but I'm going to get back to how we ended up where doing what we do. The other leases we had were all month to month and they were dead, like no one was there. So we just stopped them all. Um, we decided just to consolidate into one location, brought all of our equipment to one place, um, brought our therapist to one place. Um, and because it was COVID, we could only see everybody one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we had been um, every half hour. So everybody would overlap a little bit, um, but we couldn't do that with COVID. So we, we went to the one-on-one -on -one model and after about six months of doing it that way, it was striking. It was the same PTs providing the same treatment, but it went from one to two to one on one. And our outcomes got better. Our patients stayed until they were done with therapy. Um, I don't ever have to go back through my schedule and look for patients who disappeared. I just don't have to. Um, it just doesn't happen. They do all their therapy until they're done. And, and then we say, okay, you're done. Here's what you need to do. You know, call us if you need us. So during the middle of that, you know, it, it became apparent that, you know, the salaried PT model was very hard on us financially with the one-on-one -on -one practice. Um, so we had a therapist that was working at another place and he, at that place, had been working on a pay-per-visit, but his was a percentage of what was collected. So if, if the business didn't collect it, he didn't get paid. 
you know, if it was a lousy insurance or, you know, all the things that can happen that have nothing to do with him providing care, then he had to take that on. And he was like, I got to get out of this place. It's not going to work for me. And I was like, all right. He wanted to bring some patients that, you know, that wanted to follow with him. And I said, well, let's, I, I can't take the risk of putting you on salary because I don't have enough business for you, but I can just pay you on a per visit basis. So it doesn't matter what we collect, you get paid this flat rate every time you see a patient. If a patient shows up, you get paid. Um, you know, if they don't show up, that's not my problem. Um, so if they cancel, they don't show up. If you don't get them scheduled, if you don't provide quality care and so they don't come back, um, if they don't want to see you, they want to see somebody else, that's not going to come out of my end, right? So the idea was to just shift some of the risk from me to the provider. Um, but in that same vein, some of the reward. Um, the rate we pay is such that if you were to fill your schedule, if you saw 40 patients a week, every week for you know all but two or three weeks a year when you took vacation and you get PTO, right? So you get you get benefits, you get paid time off, you get 401k. We offer health plans, none of our therapists currently take them, but we offer benefits. So it's not like, it's not a PRN position. Um, we pay half the Medicare and Social Security. They're not, it's not a 1099 situation. If you were to do that, you would make a better living than you would as a salaried employee at another PT clinic. Now, that being said, if you schedule 40 patients a week, even with our one-on-one -on -one model, you're gonna have some cancellations. Um, but our cancellation no-show rate is seven, eight percent. Um, it's not 10, 15, 20 percent. So if you were to schedule 40 patients a week, you should expect to see 35. And at 35 patients a week, at the rate we pay, you're gonna make about what you would make working for one of the corporations. Um, but if you don't, you're gonna make less. Um, and we also allow, if you'd like, uh, and it's up to the individual therapist to set the, everybody schedules themselves. We only have one person who works in our office who's not a physical therapist, and she does everything else except treat patients, right? So billing, collections, negotiating contracts, um, paying all the bills. Um, she doesn't do scheduling because it's just, it's honestly at this point beneath her skill level. Um, and she doesn't have time for it. And we know our patients and she doesn't. So we all schedule our own patients. So you can, you're allowed to, and we've had one therapist do this, schedule their patients on 50 minute intervals so that he could see 10 patients a day instead of eight. And if, if he were to see 50 patients a week, he'd make six figures at the rate we pay. So it's up to him. It's up to the individual therapist. If you want to see yeah. 10 patients a day, make a little bit more money, but still provide one-on-one -on -one care for the vast majority of an hour, um, you can do that. If you, you know, want to take off and go home early and be done at noon, you can do that. You're just not going to get paid. Um, so it's been pretty effective. Um, patients love us. I mean, we, I mean, almost all of our patients are word of mouth referrals, you know, Google reviews and Facebook reviews. It's all five star. Um, and the other side of it is also, in addition to you getting paid for what you do, you get paid to drum up business too. So there's a bonus for any new eval that you create. So if they come because one of your patients said, Hey, you got to go see this guy, you get a bonus. Um, if, if they come because you went and marketed to a physician and then, and you tell me, Hey, I went to this physician's office, I'll pay for you to go do a lunch with them. I'll come along with you if you want me to, um, I will provide whatever marketing materials you want. If that generates referrals, every time a new patient walks through the door for an appointment, they come in, they get seen for the eval, you get a bonus. Now you don't get a bonus for every visit that person comes for, you get it for the eval. So if you can get yourself busier you get a bonus for ge generating the business and you get paid for seeing the patient. Um, if I have to generate all the business, then you just get paid for seeing the patient. It's interesting because you also, um, and, and I don't want to steal your thunder here, but I think the the skeptical person listening to this would say, well, but Jake is probably in some environment where he can just dominate the local in, uh, the local market and, and do these sorts of things. But what's interesting about your model is, is that not only is it working for you, but it's working in an environment where you actually have some pretty large competitors in the area. Your your market is pretty competitive. Is that that's is that right? Yeah. There's a there's a benchmark of less than a mile from my office that was there before we got there. There's an ATI and a PT solutions that I could hit a golf ball to. Um they are they are right on either corner of my of my business. Yeah. And I, I and I and I say that with all the respect in the world too, by the way, because again, the, the most skeptical people listening would be like, oh, well, this can't possibly work in my backyard. In your particular case, you sort of said this in as many words just a minute ago that like these clinicians that choose to work with you will make 
equal or more than what they could have made at some of these larger, uh, larger, I'll do air quotes here, larger uh, or more established practices. Well, and the other side of it, the, just to be fair, that's also how I get paid. Um, I don't take a salary either. The only salaried employee is our um, director of operations. Um, nobody else is, everybody else that works there gets paid. We all get paid the same way. I make the same amount per visit that the therapists that work for me make. Um, so I don't pay myself more. The only way I make more money is if the company generates more profit than because I am taking on the rest of the risk. Um, so if we do generate profit, then yeah, technically I make more money, but I'm also paying huge taxes on all that profit. So it's not that much more money. It's probably a different topic altogether, I suppose. Now, just to clarify, was this always the model? No, we were salary. We were standard salary, you know, the way everybody does it until like 2022. And I will say the downside is that once you start that model, you can't hire anybody any other way, right? So if I've got people working on a per visit basis, I can't put a staff therapist on a salary next to them because then I have to fill the salary the office person first. And this way, there's a little more equity. It's more equitable. It probably better aligns with similar roles in non-healthcare industries. You know, I know it probably sounds bad, but it's kind of like a commissioned sales rep uh, in real estate or cars or, you know, any other industry. So it's not a, it's not a bad thing. Actually, so I've been teaching, I graduated PT school in 2002. I started teaching continuing education classes in 05. And when I started teaching Con Ed, one of my big sales pitches was that you can't just be doing the right things and not knowing why you're doing them. The, the most important um, aspect of providing care is knowing why you're doing it. And the reason is that at the end of the day, every therapist is a salesperson. You are selling yourself. You are selling that what I'm going to do is going to make you better. And so you need to keep coming to me in order for that to work. You can be the best therapist in the world. If the patient doesn't come back, you can't help them. So your job is sales already. It was sales before you ever stepped foot into a clinic. So this just makes it where you've got some skin in the game. If you're providing quality care and explaining to patients the importance of, and the value of being there to get treated, then they'll come back. And if you abuse that relationship, if you tell somebody they need to come three times a week for eight weeks when they really need to come once a week for six weeks, they're not going to keep coming and they're not going to recommend you. So you can be, um, you know, you can be short term effective, but long term, it's not going to work. It's, it's not going to play out well for you. So you really have to have the whole long-term mindset. Really, you have to be putting the patient first. You have to be considering what's best for the patient is going to end up being what's best for everybody else. Right, right. It, it, it's super interesting because you're sort of um, enabling these people to be, th these clinicians to be a little bit more in control. Whether, now, whether that, not everybody's probably wired that way. A lot of clinicians nope. may not even want that kind of role. But in this particular case, you're enabling them to kind of have more of an influence on the outcome of their own financial position. Yeah, and you're 100% right. Most clinicians don't want to be entrepreneurs. So it is a, it is specific individuals. And that is part of our interview process. Uh, I, I mean, I start off at the very beginning with, do you consider yourself entrepreneurial? Because if you don't, yeah. you're probably not going to like working here. Because I expect you to go market your business. And I expect you to try to generate pe you know, uh, patients and and to have some skin in the game, to have to take on some of the risk. Can you talk a little bit about some of the marketing? So you you said a few minutes ago that, you know, they get a essentially a kicker or a spiff, uh, as we'd probably call it in the sales world, if they acquire a new patient or bring in a new patient on their own. Just in broad strokes, like I, I imagine that to mean that like if one of your clinici cl clinicians is a runner, they go hang out at their local run club or something like that. Can you talk a little bit about some of the creative ways now that these, pe these, these people that work with your firm are incentivized to bring in more patients? Like what are some of the interesting tactics that you've seen them use to, to make that happen? The first person we had to do this full time uh, just left. He's actually really kind of a funny story. He moved to Alabama to be closer to family. He told me about maybe about a month before he left, that uh, I've ruined him, um, that he couldn't find any place that would let him practice the way that he was practicing with us. And he was like, I'm, I'm ruined. Like, I don't, I, I'm, I'm so spoiled. I don't know what to do now. He was interested in, in runners. He did, he did some marketing in, the, in that realm, sort of what you're talking about, kind of going to run clubs. But really, he had an interest in learning to treat T, uh, TMD, tempor temporal mandibular disorder. And so he, we paid for him to take a Con Ed class on it. And he, you know, became, I guess, I don't know that you could become an expert in something from a con ed class, but he, you know, he gained some experience in that, in that realm. And then he went on to market to dentists, right? So he would go out to the dentist office and talk to them and tell them what we did and what he did and, and try to generate business that way. Um, the therapist that replaced him 
is um, a runner, but really more he's a, a workout enthusiast. And so he's gone to Crunch Fitness. Um, he's gone to uh, Big Peach Running, and he started marketing to those places. Now, I mean, he's only been here for three weeks, so it hasn't generated any business yet, but um, that's that's his goal. And I've told him, like, you know, it takes seven points of contact before you're actually going to see any return on your investment in this stuff. So just keep going out there. Just keep put, just keep going back and putting yourself in front of the same people. Um, eventually, it will probably pay off. Years ago, we had a therapist before we were on this system, but we had a therapist that came to us because she had worked for a corporate practice and she was a triathlete and she wanted to treat triathletes. And the corporate pr place she worked for wouldn't give her time off to go market. And I was like, you want to generate business for me? Yes. And they won't give you time for that. And she was like, no. I'm like, well, that's just crazy. I was like, come work with us. I'll give you all the time you want to go generate your own business. So she was um, big at, at, in the Atlanta Run Club. And so she generated business through them um, and her contacts with them. And then, you know, we do the traditional marketing to orthos that everybody does. I've been doing marketing like that for, for more than 17 years because I used to work for a corporate practice and I never know when it's going to work. I mean, I, I, I'll go have a lunch with somebody and have the greatest conversation that I've ever had with another provider, get their personal cell phone number, have promises that they, oh, I've got this patient in mind for you. I've got this patient. Never hear from them again. Um, I'll go and, you know, the doc will kind of poke their head in and be like, where are you at? Okay. And then walk away and become one of my biggest referral sources. Like, I, I don't know. It, it's so frustrating. I never can tell if it's going to be effective, but you just got to keep doing it. And then eventually some of them work out. Oh, I, just me personally, because I live in the neighborhood right behind my clinic, I'm on a couple of different tennis teams. My kids did the swim team in the neighborhood. Both my kids are in the band at the local high school. So just literally being a member of the community is an easy, an easy end to get a lot of the referrals that way. If you don't mind my asking though, you, so you said you graduated, um, you know, with your in, from PT uh, in 2002. What was your undergrad? Uh, marketing or oh, what no, were you? Science. Okay, so so I got to ask then, like, uh, what you know? Hindsight's always twenty twenty, but um, most practice owners are. I don't want to speak poorly of them, but just to be candid, like most practice owners love the idea of entrepreneurship far more than the actual. What 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 was the in hindsight? What was the tipping point for you to kind of really start thinking this way? One is my dad was a PT and he owned um, 14 offices in the Atlanta area and sold them to what became Physiotherapy Associates. The name of his company was Physical Therapy Associates. And he sold in 93 before the Balanced Budget Act of 96. And he didn't want me to go into PT because he's like, you can't make any money in PT anymore. And uh, I was like, well, and I, I took that as a challenge. I was like, well, you made money. Like I can make money. And he's like, you don't understand. It's not the same. And, and uh, I didn't understand, to be perfectly honest. But put it this way, my dad owned his own practice for 20 years. My mom is a real estate broker. She owns her own business. My brother's a real estate broker. He owns his own business. Most of my uncles own their own business. Uh, my in-laws own their own business. I just honestly, everybody that I'm related to in some way, shape or form is a, is a private business owner. Well, I was going to say like, uh, you don't want to be the odd man out at Thanksgiving and be <laughs> like, oh, 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 Jake over there. Yeah. Jake's just an employee somewhere. <laughs> like, I get it. <laughs> so the funny story part, the tipping point for me leaving the corporate practice I worked for was I was actually a fairly successful clinic director and was invited to a company meeting uh, for the successful clinic directors. They took us to Disney. They spent all this money on us. And the whole time they were spending money on us, I was like, we earned that money. Like, they're making it seem like they're giving me something, but they're not. Like, it's, we generated all this. They're, they're just spending it. And the CEO of the company at the time gave this speech at this meeting. And it was just the most uninspirational, almost insulting speech that I'd ever seen. And at the end, and I think he intended it for it to be like motivational and get us excited and it, it went really differently in his head, for sure. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, at the end of the speech, I was like, I'm out. Like, I'm I, I, I'm finding my exit. Like, here, I got to find a way out of here. Once I knew I was going to do outpatient ortho, I always knew I wanted to start my own practice. It just was a matter of when and where. Um, and then when I was looking for space, so I was literally in the process of trying to, I was, I had my exit strategy. I was talking to insurance companies. I was getting a lawyer. I was getting a bank account. I was looking for space. And at the time I was working with this uh, professional baseball player. His name's Michael Barrett. He was the catcher for the Cubs for four and a half years. Um, played in the bigs for over a decade. And I was his physical therapist. And 
he came in one day to his appointment and he was irritated. Like he was, he was on the arm bike and I thought he was going to break the machine. Like he was like pumping it like it was insane. And I'm like, hey man, what is going on? And he said, well, I'm starting this baseball training facility and half of it's going to be a gym. And I had this trainer that was going to come in and rent that half from me. And that was going to make it all work. And we sat down to sign the paperwork and the trainer didn't show up. Yeah, ghosted him. Yeah. Yeah. And he was irritated that this whole deal was going to fall through because this guy didn't show up. And so did my treatment with him, sent him on his way I, all day long. It just was in the back of my head kind of spinning like, hang on a second, like, I could take over that space. Like I'm looking for space and he's telling me he's got space and he's going to fill it with equipment and there's going to be kids coming through doing baseball. Like, why don't I do it? So I called him up and just said, Hey, what, what about me? Right. And he called me back and he's like, man, the hair in the back of my neck stood up. Oh, what a great idea. I don't know why I didn't think of it. And I was like, well, <laughs> well one of us thought of it. that night drove out and looked through the windows of this empty warehouse and, and, and hand shook on a, on a dollar amount to pay per month. Um, that ended up being the contract that we had for, I mean, gosh, we were together for eight or nine years. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. You know, and I, I should have asked you this at the beginning too. So your practice today in terms of cash versus insurance, like how, what is that? What do you guys, how are you guys set up? Like what is, um, do you guys accept insurance? So we're mostly insurance. Um, and, but we don't take United Healthcare. We don't take Cigna. Um, the one, you know, the ones that are the flat rate, low paying, we can't afford to do it at the, at, at the one-on-one, which you can't, we're trying to figure out a way to capture those people that call and say, no, I have to go where they take my insurance. And we've been trying to explain to people we're like, yeah, but the place that takes your insurance might be billing a hospital rate and you've got a $10,000 deductible. So it's actually going to cost you more to go there. And we've been telling them that and they go, well, but they take my insurance. So that's where I'm going to go. And we're like, like, that doesn't mean what you think it means. So we're kind of working on a marketing strategy for that. Uh, we haven't really figured out how to, how to capture that. But in the meantime, our cash rate, we do a little differently. I think we do it a little differently. And by doing it different, differently, I mean, we do it exactly the same way we bill everything else. So we bill them per unit as a dollar rate per unit for per 15 minutes you're seeing. So if you come for 30 minutes, it costs half of what it costs if you come for an hour, um, as opposed to being a flat rate, um, no matter what, all right? So I know a lot of PT clinics for cash, it's $200 a visit, no matter how long you're here, no matter what we're doing. Um, instead, we do it, we kind of tailor it to the patient's needs and, and we try to keep it as minimal as possible. But again, that comes in nice where the therapist schedules their own patients, right? So if I've got a cash patient coming and I know I'm trying to keep them to 45 minutes so that I can keep them to three units, I can book another patient on the 45 minute time frame that might be another cash patient or might be someone else that I know that I'm not going to treat for a full hour. Um, so then, then I can kind of stack my schedule a little bit. Maybe I see nine patients that day instead of eight because I schedule my own patients. So that allows me that, that leeway to maybe squeeze in an extra visit because I know the cash patient's not going to come for as long. Totally random topic here, and you can totally shoot this down. You will not hurt my feelings. But I have a story and a potential idea for you. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Okay, so I told you at the beginning, before we even hit record, I'm not from, from healthcare. Thomas, a lot of the folks that I brought onto the team over the last couple of years, particularly in product and or, um, marketing and engineering, are not from healthcare. Not because I don't believe in healthcare workers or anything, but rather that that, you know, different people are good at different things. So... I hate taking my car in. Like I've got four kids now. I I used to I used to be so proud of the fact that I would work on my own car, change the oil, change the brakes, and then now I'm 43. I got a bunch of kids. I can't do that anymore. And so years ago, I met this guy named Craig at the dealership that I'd bought that car from back then. Over the years, I've been through lots of different cars, lots of different brands, but I've always stayed with him. I've always just wherever he's at. He probably doesn't know this, but I, anyway. I go to him. So now this guy, Craig, uh, works at a, at a Cadillac dealership. I don't own a Cadillac. I got a Suburban with four car seats in the back, you know? So, so um, but now he works this this dealer. And so he's been there for about a year and I've been with him for two oil changes and some tires here and stuff like that. Anyway, what's interesting to me is, is that over the years, his own tactics have changed. And most recently, I noticed that after both of my appointments in the last 12 months with him, he is aggressive, but friendly about getting a Google review for the shop after I leave. This happened last week. So he was texting me, hey, Paul, you know, just real quick, can you do this? Can you just go on here, click this link, say something nice about the dealership and me and all that? So anyway, I 
I happened to be driving by there to go pick up one of my kids after camp uh, here last week. And so I stopped in. I had a minute. And so I stopped in. I said, hey, man, I, I, I don't I didn't I just figured I'd stop by because I don't know if you're like texting me from like a work computer. And now, now I'm going to put you in an awkward situation. I said, why now? Like, why are you doing this? I mean, you know, I'm going to come with you everywhere. And he said, I get an extra 50 bucks per visit if I can get you to say something to, uh, nice about the firm or the the dealership after every, ep- or what you guys would call an episode in healthcare. He's like, after every visit where, where we know we've like resolved everything. And that's why he was like, yeah, two new reviews is a hundred bucks extra a year for me on, on, on that. So the point is, I think that, you know, when I look at like your website for pro performance therapy and all that stuff, you know, I see all the stuff and all that, but I only see 32 Google reviews. I know for sure, if I had to guess, you do, you see a lot more patients than that, uh, you know, per month and per year. And given that you're already like kind of thinking about incentives, I think that might be interesting to just consider is like, what is there, is there a way to actually encourage your clinicians after I've come in for my six visits? Yeah. After my episode of care, you know, Hey, let's get that review. I think that you know, a lot of practices, like you've done a wonderful job just looking at, you know, from an armchair's length here. And for anybody listening, we don't have a business relationship together. It's not like I get anything for promoting you. But the point is, though, is that like, you've done a wonderful job to be around for 17 years to, 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 to be doing as well as you're doing with all these competitors and stuff like that. So it's not like you need any more advice from me. But we do know from a local marketing standpoint across every other industry that Google dominates search results. We know that most consumers use search as a as one of the avenues they use to vet a new vendor, whether it's healthcare or oil changes or whatever. So it's like, hey, you know, how do you make that go from 32 total all-time reviews to potentially 30 new uh, reviews every month? And we know that Google will reward that. No, that's good advice. But it's funny because for years, um, we knew that we needed the Google reviews, but I'm terrible at asking patients for them. Um, I don't like asking for them. And we had a student who went to a marketing course and came out with this plan. He was like, he's like, you don't ask for them. You give them something to take with them that tells them how to do it. Because if you ask, even if you, even if I asked, and I would have dozens of patients tell me, oh, I'd love to leave you a review. I'll definitely do that. Nothing, right? Because they don't remember. It's not part of their cycle. It's not part of their daily routine. They don't recall that they're supposed to do that. Um, so it's just a little placard with like detailed instructions of exactly what to click, where to go, what to type in, even some like ideas, like maybe talk about the one-on-one model, maybe talk about how it's different from someplace else you were, right? Some just little hints as to things that they should say. And we have these little things sitting on a shelf on the way out the door and about Three or four times a year, I remember to hand one to somebody. Like, I, it's just it's, it's just about making it a habit, right? It's about making it part of my routine that when I'm telling somebody, hey, here's the exercise to do for the next six months and let me know if you need anything else. Oh, by the way, here's this thing you need to you know follow up with. Yeah, I yep. think 100% incentivizing the, the therapist to do that is a great idea. And honestly, I'll tell you, patients all the time try to tell me how to market and they don't have any idea what they're talking about. They, they'll tell me things to do and I'm like, yeah, that won't work. Like uh, you don't understand the business. That's not going to be effective. But what you just described is a good idea. First of all, I love this, that story of like a student going to a class and come up with these ideas. These are like, that's wonderful. I, I also think that, you know, the, the thing that they don't teach in marketing school. So I've never been a marketer. I was like uh, electrical engineering and computer science, double major. Uh, and my sort of breakthrough personally with embracing marketing and psychology and all that was just coming to this fundamental realization 20 years ago that even though engineering is fun and all that, the, the, the most powerful people, well, however you define power, it could be freedom, you know, money, power, whatever. But the most powerful people in the room tended to be the ones that could talk to lots of different types of people in a way that like connected with them without being condescending or aloof or anything like that. And so anyway, the person that could talk to the engineers and the client, for example, tended to have the most freedom. They were the ones in my mind when I was young, like, how are they playing golf on a Friday? Like, all of us have to work 80 hours a week, you know? Well, so the point is, though, is that like, you know, it's all about friction. So I could probably condense all of marketing into maybe one or two statements. People don't care. People are busy. Make it easy for them. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> and 100%. so even with like the idea of like a card with a QR code, 
wonderful idea, but you know, I don't know. I don't know about you, but like I can barely keep my track of my wallet, you know, and, and you hand me a business card. It's just different now. Depending on the type of patient you see determines the medium that you want to use. So for example, like I'm 43. I don't know what I am, a Gen X. I don't know what I am, but texting me is probably the least frictiony way to get me to do something. Just mm-hmm. give me a link. Click here. It'll take you 30 seconds. Please tell say something nice about us if I helped you, you know. Whereas like my mom in her 70s, like she values the paper and you're probably better off trying to get her to do it as she exits the building, not letting her go home with it. Like here, pull out your phone and let me show you what to do. And yeah, yeah. Like I do it. And again, like you and I don't have any personal business relationship here, but I think that, you know, why your model is really fascinating to me is, is that whether you know it or not, I think that if more practices sort of embrace this idea of seeing themselves as like a marketing firm, the more they'd actually get what they want out of these practices. You know, like a lot of people are like, oh, I was, so one of the questions I ask people is like, why'd they start a practice? You know, and inevitably the answer is like, I didn't want to work for the man or I didn't want to be the only one at Thanksgiving, you know, whatever. And it's like, okay, cool. Now we've admitted that. So now let, to get there, let's, let's, let's embrace how we're going to get there, you know? And, and so one of the other things I imagine, and obviously don't share anything you don't feel comfortable sharing here, but I imagine one of the hardest parts of this then is sort of tracking all of this. So you got four, um, and then you've got that, that office person or non, non-clinician there as well. Um, so attribution's got to be some amount of work to track. So you've probably got a Google spreadsheet somewhere that you had to build. Like, how do you, how do you do that? Like, how are you tracking all that? Every two weeks. So we get paid every two weeks, every two weeks, each therapist sends their hours, their hours to, um, to Amanda, our, uh, business manager, well, our director of operations. So they, they send her an email and said, this is how many I saw this week. This is how many I saw this week. This is my total sends it off to her. And if she sees something in there that's like, wait a second, they were out for two days last week, or they had a bunch of cancellations, she can just go back and add them up. But you know, we try to keep it as easy as possible for her because she has 19 other things to be doing. So yeah, it's super simple. Yeah, I like every two weeks, I just go back and look at my schedule. I count the number of patients I saw and I send them to her and she gets me paid. See, I, I, I had a feeling you were going to say it was that something that's simple because a lot of people are listening to this are probably like, oh my gosh, I love this idea. And now it's going to be spreadsheet hell while I try to track it. But, you know. One of the other reasons I left corporate practice and one of the things that I'd recognize as a, I won't say a flaw, but like a, something I'm not good at, right? You got to know your weaknesses. I'm a terrible manager. Um, I have no interest in telling you how to do your job. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm not good at it. I don't want to do it. I didn't grow up in a family that we got credit for doing what we were supposed to do. I, I got straight A's in college and I told my dad and my dad went, well, what are you going to do next semester? Like, it was like, he's like, they're, he literally said, because they're, they're not my grades. What do I care? Um, so there was never any credit given for doing your job. Like if you're expected to do it, then and you get it and you do it. It's like, okay, that's, that's all there is. They're table stakes, gonna, table yeah. stakes. Yeah. And then also in that vein though, you were expected to do what you were expected to do. Right. So if you, if this was your job and you're supposed to go do this thing, then I just expect you to do it. I'm not going to look over your shoulder and, and count your patient visits for you and make sure that your, your numbers add up. Um, now, if it looks like somebody's abusing it, obviously we'll, we'll catch that. But everybody that works at my office is a former student of mine. So there's a lot of mutual respect. I can't imagine anybody trying to cheat me. Like it just doesn't even cross my mind that somebody would do that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think it would work in a corporate practice to be hundred percent honest. If you had a thousand therapists doing that, you're going to have fraud and abuse. Like, I don't see any way you wouldn't, but we're a small group of people and then we love working together. So, you know, uh, everybody, we just kind of have them all on the honor system and you're supposed to turn in your hours and count them up for yourself. And we expect that you're going to do it. I think the thing is, though, is that, um, uh, what you're describing is, is very common in a lot of other industries. Like, like I guess what I'm trying to say is that you and I both know there's a number of like franchised practices that are out there. And, you know, I don't know about you, but for me, on the one hand, I don't rationally get the appeal of a franchise, like the way I'm wired. I'm like, well, wait a second, why would you give away a percentage of operational uh, profit because of having a logo? But then I have to like remind myself that most people want to uh, want to love the idea of entrepreneurship, but the risk itself is either not something they're interested in, or maybe because of life challenges, they can't take on that risk. And so the point is that there is a reason why franchises exist. It's because like there, there is an in-between between like fully owning your risk versus sharing some of that risk. And I think that, um, my, my poorly articulated comment here though, is that 
I think there is something there. I think that, you know, not that my opinion matters, but I, I think that given how many people are willing to, to, to put a significant amount of money down to own franchises of other names, you, you know the names I'm thinking of, I think that this model could be pretty interesting as well. We got to do something to get the care back in healthcare. And I know that sounds like very like a bumper sticker or something, but it's unsustainable, the, the model, the way it is right now, um, especially in PT. The venture capitalist owned approach, um, I'm sure it's, it's great for, for making money, but it's just so bad for the profession. Um, I've, I've said, honestly, for decades now that if my competitors were better at their job, I'd be busier, which sounds counterintuitive, but so many people won't go to PT because they've had a bad experience that would have more people would be willing to go to PT or interested in going or looking into going if, if people were doing a better job. Even if, and I know it sounds weird to think that I want my competition to do a better job, but if they did better, then more people would trust PT and more people would go. So it would, it would grow the pie, right? So my slice might stay the same amount, but the whole pie would get bigger instead of the way that it's being done. And there's just no vision to these models. There's no long-term vision. It, 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 they, they don't seem to know or don't seem to care that they're destroying the whole profession. Um, and that long term, it's going to crash everybody together, you know, not just us, not just the small businesses. The flip side of that is so, you know, f disclaimer. So I actually started a venture capital firm 15 years ago that we still operate and, and all that stuff. But um, so I say that just as a disclaimer so people kind of know my viewpoint on this. That being said, we're not a private equity firm. We don't roll up, you know, practices and stuff like that. Where I'm going to go with this, though, is, is that. What's fascinating to me as an industry, like of, of physical therapy, OT, speech, and all that, is that the only people that think there's no money in this are the people actually practicing it. Because private equity wouldn't be here if the dollars weren't there. Uh, large healthcare systems wouldn't exist if the, the numbers weren't there. The, so I'm not like defending all those people. All I'm just trying to say is, is that I actually think that the sooner we actually encourage the clinicians themselves to understand that the boogeyman is not the payer or some singular person. I think the sooner we actually convince them that the boogeyman is actually themselves and the internal dialogues that we, we talk to ourselves and say to ourselves every day, if we can just get over that first, I think everything else becomes a lot easier. So for example, your model may not be the right model for everybody, but it, it, it is a testament to the fact that it works it seems to be growing. It's operated for 17 years. Most businesses fail in the first year. So it's working. And, and the point is, though, is that like it proves that there is money there. And it proves, I think, something that Charlie Munger, who uh, was the right hand man for Warren Buffett for decades, Charlie Munger used to say, if you show him a person's incentives, he will show you what they will do. It's actually not dissimilar to the way you engage a patient. Um... Uh, somebody told me years ago, and I just have clung to the to the statement. And I agree with it. You, I can't motivate you, right? I can't give you motivation. I can only find what motivates you, and then entice you with it, right? So I need to find as a patient. I need to know what is it that you want to be able to do that you can't do, and how can I help you get there, right? But I can't do the work for you. I can't. And I can't make you want to do it. Um, but I can find out what would make you want to do it and put that out in front of you. I'm personally curious, what, what's next for, for your practice? Like, um, you know, we sort of alluded to this idea that not everybody wants to have 750 locations that are a million clinicians or whatever, but I know nobody knows the future, but when you think about the next five years, which would be 23 years in business for you, what is, what is, uh, what are you thinking about doing with the practice? So we used to have multiple offices. And a matter of fact, when we were the, when we were the most successful, we had four offices. Um, and it, uh, honestly, that's the goal. The goal is to get back to uh, not thousands, but um, dozens would be lovely. Um, so I'll tell you, when I started it, you, it this kind of circles back to where we started from, which is like, what did I see or what did I want to do? Um, I want to be a place where healthcare is done right. And I want great clinicians to want to work there. Um, my wife is a school teacher and you know how you make more money in, as a school teacher, have another birthday. That's it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You have one more year experience. You make one more year's experience worth of money. And that's a terrible model. 
Um, and so I, I don't, uh, we don't do raises that way either. We, you know, basically it's all performance based, right? So you make more money because you generated more business or you saw more patients, not because you were there for one more year. So the goal has always been, and this is where I've been incredibly unsuccessful, um, but it's still what I, what I want to do. I want to be an example. I want to be that shining city on a hill, right? I want my office to function in such a way that the therapists love what they do and great PTs want to come work there. And when great PTs want to come work there, then you get the best PTs and then you get the best care and that will generate the be the business. Um, and the reason I brought up uh, education is that that's how it should be in education, right? So my wife worked at private schools forever. And one of the weirdest things about private schools is they actually pay less than public right. schools because it's yeah. a better work environment. And my thought was, Man, that's just so crazy. They should be, the private schools should be paying three times what the public schools pay. And then the best teachers would want to come work there. And then you're going to get the students who, who, the parents who want their kids where the best teachers are. Um, and so I just wanted to apply that thought process to healthcare, to, to physical therapy in particular, that if we can have a model that makes people happy and enjoy their life and enjoy their job and make a good living, and that they want to come work there, then we can get the best, right? And if we can get the best, then we can be the best, then we can grow that model. And really the idea is to show those clinicians working at those practices where they're seeing 20, 25 patients a day, that there is another way, that you don't have to accept that. That's super interesting. I, I'm sure you already thought about it, but uh, your, your, your guy that moved to Alabama could be the the beginnings of uh, your first Alabama office. You he know? asked me, he was like, you should open an office in Alabama? And I was like, well, you don't know anybody in Alabama yet. So you might need to go get your feet wet and like actually have a, a business to start, but talk to me when you're ready. Um, the therapist that left before him, um, it was just too far a drive. She lived about an hour and a half away and she still worked with us for a year and a half. And then finally she, she had a little kid and she's like, I just can't, the commute's too much. Um, but she's like, hey, if you want to open an office in Decatur, um, let me know. I'd be happy to, you know, be the one running it. So we're getting some people out there in the world that uh, that want to do this model. And I had a a student who just graduated. Who his idea for a PT practice is very similar to what I do. Um, and unfortunately, and I wanted to hire him too, but he, unfortunately, he's moved into Texas. But um, he wanted a barbershop model, the the classic barbershop model where the, the PT essentially rents the chair, right? So the PT is going to give you some money for the overhead of running, of having the practice there and for, you know, having the people there to do the billing and collections. And then you catch what you kill. Whatever you get com coming in is yours, which is, is a really interesting idea. Uh, ours is not quite like that because our PTs don't pay us to work there, but it's pretty close where everybody's kind of their own business owner. Thanks for listening to another episode of Strata Stories. Strata PT is a single EMR platform and revenue cycle management service for physical, occupational, and speech therapy practices that helps you achieve a 99.99% reimbursement rate. If you'd like to learn more about Strata PT and see how our EMR and RCM works, head over to stratapt.com to book a demo.